Uh, Farid is a well-known expert in Austria and in Europe on the topic Islamophobia. Uh, he also uh, edits a yearbook uh, to that effect, uh, uh, which uh, a new issue just came out. He has been uh, teaching and working at the University of Salzburg in Austria and just finished his Habilitation. Uh, habilitation meaning his, in the US acad academic world, you would say his second book. Uh, so we are very glad that uh, Farid has agreed uh, uh, to talk to us and he is gonna give a half hour talk and you see with a, a PowerPoint and then uh, you can ask questions. So the floor is yours, Dr. Hafez, please. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, first of all, for having me here. Uh, it's always a pleasure again and to reconnect, uh, you know, since uh, the COVID pandemic has brought so many people apart from each other. It's always great to reconnect and uh, have conversations. I'm glad really to be here and uh, all my thanks to uh, Professor Günther Bischoff and also uh, the Center Austria at the University of New Orleans. Um, my talk today is on race, Islam and othering in contemporary Europe. And what I'm uh, basically going to do is uh, kind of uh, draw a little bit on some of the works that I've been uh, uh, doing uh, throughout the last few years. One is a German anthology that has just appeared a few months ago, uh, which is called, um, I'll, I'll just translate it, uh, The Other Austria, Life in Austria Beyond male, white, heteronormative German Catholic dominance, which basically uh, gave space to a lot of people who do not belong to one or more of these identities uh, in order to speak about what really does it mean uh, uh, in, at the backdrop of racism in manifold forms to live a life in Austria. And the other part is uh, as um, has also been mentioned beyond, beyond my yearbook that I've been editing since 2010. Uh, there, I have been the co-editor of the European Islamophobia Report, which we've been doing since 2015. Uh, that is a collective work of more than 30 uh, uh, authors each year, uh, where we cover roughly 30 plus uh, countries in Europe and look at um, what is going on in terms of Islamophobia in different fields. And I'm at the very same time also the author of the Austrian part of this report. So in a way, what I always do is like, at least on an annual uh, <clears throat> uh, um, level, to try to observe the most important developments that we can see in terms of what is going on when we speak about Islamophobia in Austria. All right, um, and by the way, that's, the, that's just the link uh, for the report. Uh, you, you can download that for free and also the previous versions, um, which should be online soon at this new website. And also some of what I'm discussing here will also be very soon uh, published in an article of an anthology on uh, religious othering, uh, global dimensions, edited by Mark Jürgensmeyer, Kathleen Moore, and Dominic Sachsenmeyer, um, where I look not only on Austria, but also Germany. All right, so what is important if we want to understand uh, the role of Muslims in Austria today, how they're making, and um, how Islamophobia or anti-Muslim racism, as I would also call it, um, emerges and, and shapes the lives of Muslims. So I think from a longer historical perspective, and I think that, that, is, an, um, that is something which is kind of a, a new way how to approach these issues, um, because um, I think very often in the literature, you will see that a lot of the scholarship basically looks at um, the life of Muslims starting with uh, the immigration of poor, the working, uh, uh, the labor of uh, 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 working people coming from Turkey starting in the 1960s, but not really going beyond that. And I think that is not only something that is very specific to looking at the, the, the history, the rather young history of Muslims in Austria, but rather is it something very symptomatic um, to a lot of the at least German scholarship uh, when we look at uh, the research on minorities. 
Um, and one of the interesting aspects here, I think, is there is a st stark contrast when you look um, to uh, um, at the at, at the literature uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world and how it deals really with a, a lot of these issues that I'm going to talk about here. So, in my understanding, I think three of the key moments or key uh, phases that really shape um, anti-Muslim racism today is post-colonialism, post-Nazism, and the rise of the far right in the early 1920s. Um, when I speak about post-colonialism, um, and, and here is what I think is, is, so, um, is so interesting um, uh, really to reveal, when we when Muslims today have conversations, or even if you look at the political elite and how it frames uh, the, be, the becoming of the Islam Act, for instance, that was uh, originally uh, had emerged in 1912 in the last, last few years of the existence of the uh, Austrian-Hungarian monarchy, then there is a lot of what I would call a mystification of this inclusion of Islam into the political body of then back then the dual monarchy and today uh, the Second Republic of Austria. Um, and while it is absolutely true and important um, that the legal basis for the legal recognition of Islam was laid basically during the time of the dual monarchy, uh, some of the issues that are completely ignored are issues around the contestation and the questions of war questions also of the restructuring and the, the original structuring of Islam by a colonial power, which is the dual monarchy. And I think one of the reasons why we do not have these discussions is because there is a widespread colonial amnesia when we speak about the, the dual monarchy's uh, role uh, in, in the 19th century. So because of this mystification and this idealization of the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy as this kind of multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious um, political body, which it was to, to, to an extent, right? But again, then there is the other part of really uh, the, the back then, the finance minister um, of, uh, of the hung, uh, Austro-Hungarian monarchy, uh, especially uh, von Kallai, who really tried to control uh, the, and, and the establishment of the new, uh, newly uh, organized uh, Muslim institutions uh, in order to separate them basically uh, from back then the Ottoman Empire. And a lot of these things I think uh, reoccur in a, in, a, in a somewhat different context, but uh, really reveals a very similar logic when we look at contemporary Islam related politics in Austria. So the other aspect, which I think is crucial when we speak about race and Islam and the racialization of Muslims is post-Nazism. And here again, um, I mean, we, we're currently witnessing the so-called second hist uh, historical Streit, right? Uh, which is done by people like Dirk Moses and Jürgen Zimmerer and others uh, discussing uh, the, the connection between uh, the Holocaust and colonialism. Uh, which is a debate that we do not really have to that extent in Austria. Um, and I think I don't have to go into detail for all of you folks who are into Austrian studies, you know very well uh, how um, um, problematic a lot of the discussion and, uh, um, and the silence around uh, the Nazi regime and its, uh, its uh, legacy in today's Austria is. But I think one aspect that I really want to, to uh, <clears throat> focus a little bit more on is the question of anti-Semitism. Because um, the way we, uh, we largely imagine anti-Semitism, which led to the Holocaust, um, is something that is really very much um, disconnected from a larger history of racism and the global uh, history of of racial hierarchies. Um, again, if we look into the Anglo-Saxon scholarship, uh, just to mention, I mean, there is uh, so much literature that you could mention here. Um, I mean, studies showing, for instance, that the, how the Nuremberg laws 
have been related to the race laws in the United States and the really an, a strong interconnectedness as Hannah Arendt already uh, talked about in the 1950s. But um, what we are witnessing in our days is you know, when you start speaking about any kind of comparison, not necessarily about the Holocaust and today, but even anti-Semitism and other forms of racism, there is like this immediate reaction of, well, we cannot compare, which I would argue this is very much a political act of trying not to, uh, of trying to make this ni vida, never again idea uh, as far away as possible. So um, Fatima El Tayeb, who is a race scholar currently at Yale and who used to, uh, uh, she, she was, I think for the last two decades at UC San Diego and has written a lot about um, issues of race in Germany. And here, here she, she speaks uh, a bit more about Europe. And I think it's even uh, not only true, but truer even for Austria, where she argues that Europe continues to imagine itself as an autonomous entity untouched by race matters, a colorblind continent in which difference is marked along lines of nationality and ethnicity. And others are routinely ascribed to position outside the nation, allowing the externalization and thus silencing of a debate on the legacy of racism and colonialism. And I think that's especially true for the case of Austria, where um, the non-existence of the notion of race in everyday language excludes the imagination and the connection of race into our understanding of the current Muslim question, if you will. Um, so the third important moment, I think, uh, really, when we want to understand the, the relationship um, and the development of Muslims in Austria is very much the far right uh, political party, the Freedom Party of Austria, FPÖ. Um, as we know, it started becoming a more um, <clears throat> successful political party in, in the early 1990s under the leadership of Jörg Haider. And um, a very interesting event, I think, um, or a non-event in a way, uh, was definitely 9-11, which did not manifest itself in Austria the way it did in several other Western countries. Uh, due to the FPÖ back then being in power, sharing power with the conservative uh, Austrian People's Party, there was actually, there were a few attempts by the FPÖ to, um, to use uh, the, back then the, the, the global climate um, for anti-Muslim policies and basically co-opt some of the policies that had then back then been implemented in countries like France and Germany, but it was unsuccessful to do so because basically it's um, uh, <clears throat> coalition part of, partner, the, the, the Austrian People's Party was not interested in any kind of clash of civilizations rhetoric or, uh, or policies. And especially due to the pressure back then the Austrian government had to endure um, coming from the boycott initially um, of the other 14 EU member states on Austria due to its uh, co uh, co uh, forming of the coalition with the Freedom Party, which was at that time really the first time in the European Union that um, a member state had a far right party in government. Um, due to this pressure, the People's Party did not want to um, give any reasons to, uh, for, for, the, uh, for the international community to believe that it would take a far right uh, a, a way forward. And therefore, in a way, uh, the Freedom Party was kept in this uh, position as the minor partner who could not dictate these issues. And that only changed in 2005 when the Freedom Party split uh, into two parties, uh, back then under the leadership of Jörg Haider, uh, the BZÖ, uh, uh, which was a smaller party uh, consisting of the ministers who back then were still in power with, and shared power until 2007 with the People's Party and uh, the going into opposition by the Austrian Freedom Party. When in, in opposition, uh, the deliberate 
decision made by the new leader, Hans Christian Strache, and uh, the rest of the, uh, of the leadership of the party was, we're going to put our card on anti-Muslim rhetoric and mobilization. And that played out. And as we can see throughout the, uh, <clears throat> the following years, um, a lot of the election campaigns were actually rallying around this theme of anti-Muslim mobilization, trying to create this kind of scapegoat of uh, Muslim as a threat to the Austrian national body, um, which is obviously something which we have seen in, in a lot of uh, European countries, but I think also the, the far right in Austria really played a pioneer role uh, in many ways, and we can see a lot of transnational uh, cooperation following really the success that the far right in, uh, in Austria uh, 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 had in terms of its electoral victories. Um, and just to give you like one, one example of where we can see uh, how much uh, also history um, really shapes the way how we see anti-Muslim mobilization happening. Here is a poster which is taken from the uh, interwar period time, um, a poster that was uh, used um, to mobilize against social democrats. And here we can see the snake, um, which is uh, killing um, the, uh, uh, the eagle uh, symbolizing the Austrian uh, Republic, saying we have to rescue Austria and, uh, and German Christians who are threatened by whom not only the socialist snake, but really the Jewish socialist snake. You can see the kippah on the head of the snake uh, very much uh, uh, at, the, at, the, at the top of this poster. And very similarly, as we can see here with this uh, election poster of uh, Heinz Christian Strache uh, in an election campaign in 2010, where he uh, in, in a Viennese election argued that we are uh, uh, we are protecting women's rights while the Social Democratic Party is imposing the hijab, the, 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 um, the hijab on uh, the headscarf on women, right? So again, playing this, uh, this rhetoric of uh, positioning the Social Democratic Party as a social liberal party, as the one that is embracing a diversity, multiculturalism, and hence Islam, and thus also helping in Islamizing the community. So a topos which is very famous in, in the far right propaganda, which we can see from Breivik's manifesto to, to so many other uh, um, pieces of these publications um, and the rhetoric um, uh, of these political parties. Um, and again, that is just one example. I think the much more important um, development more recently is uh, not so much related to the far right, but rather uh, to uh, Sebastian Kurz, who meanwhile is no more a chancellor of Austria, but has really shaped um, uh, the Austrian political landscape um, since uh, 2015. And I would argue when it comes to the Islam related politics since 2011, when he uh, became uh, Secretary of uh, Integration Affairs within the Ministry of Interior. But it, especially when he became Minister of Foreign Affairs and Integration Affairs in 2015, and then two years later, the Chancellor in a coalition with the far right, that was really the moment when um, these anti-Muslim claims were implemented as policies. And we can see that clearly uh, with the Islam Act of 2015 that was implemented, um, uh, which was basically a new act um, that um, broke heavily with the Islam Act of 1912, and which, um, I mean, you, you can say a lot about that act, and there are so many details to it, but if I, if I want to summarize it and really put it in a nutshell, I would argue the Islam Act had two important implications. One was that the Islamic religious society, which is recognized by this act, has been put under heavy state surveillance and also gave the, the chancellor and uh, the, the pot, a potential 
uh, inter uh, possibilities of intervention into the internal affairs of the Muslim religious community, which is in a way very unique. Why? Because the idea of the, of the Austrian form of secularism is that there is a separation, but a separation also implying that neither is the state allowed to interfere into religious affairs, nor are the churches or religious communities allowed to interfere into state affairs. So it's a vice versa protection of both bodies. And that is what has changed with the Islam Act. And then the second um, uh, important implication, it also gave in a way uh, the Islamic religious community more power, but not vis-a-vis -vis the state authorities, but rather vis-a-vis -vis the Muslim communities that before the Islam Act of 2015 would organize themselves based on the law of association, uh, the Vereinsrecht, and not uh, based on the, uh, on the Islam Act of 2015, which now put them also under the surveillance of the Muslim religious community. So there are a lot of social movements out there and NGOs uh, were pressured to either dissolve themselves or become part of the Islamic religious community. And <clears throat> that I think really opened the door for a lot of uh, other, uh, and numerous other legislations that really have heavily impacted uh, the life of Muslim communities beyond the organized uh, Islamic religious society. Um, first of all, there is the Integration Act of 2017 that uh, impl uh, implied also, uh, or that implemented um, as part of it the um, Act, uh, the Face Whale Ban Act, as it is called, um, and then um, the hijab ban that followed in 2018, first in kindergarten, then in primary school, and uh, they wanted just recently to extend it to a secondary school, but uh, due to a decision made by the Austrian Constitutional Court, um, this law was uh, revoked. Um, also, in the time of the coalition government of the Austrian People's Party and the, and the far right, which lasted from December 2017 to May 20, uh, uh, 2019, uh, there was also uh, the closure of several mosques that happened. And one of the very interesting aspects is here, because obviously the the conservative uh, people's party when they came to power they would not use the same blatant and aggressive rhetoric which the freedom party had used for so long time rather what it did was to basically argue that islam is part of austria that even the government of austria is trying to protect muslims and all of these initiatives that i'm talking about here are basically meant to rescue Muslims from the bad Muslims. And one important um, notion that was shaped during those years was uh, the notion of political Islam. So political Islam became basically the representative of everything that is bad with Muslims. So one of the initiatives, um, I mean, it was not only the hijab ban that was uh, legitimated by drawing on the the fight against political Islam. It was also the closure of mosques, which actually was also revoked by the administrative court in Vienna where it happened after seven mosques were closed. And then there was also this establishment of the documentation center of political Islam um, that was established in 2020. And more recently after the first uh, militant attack happened in, uh, in autumn 2020, there was also the ban of political Islam in 2021. So all of these initiatives are, I think, examples of how the anti-Muslim policies have really materialized and not so much um, um, while the Freedom Party was in, in power, but really when, all, when the People's Party, especially what um, for those uh, who observe Austrian daily politics amongst you uh, uh, know that these years under the leadership of Sebastian Kurz were really uh, heavily shaped by kind of trying to uh, give the people to the People's Party, which was also renamed as the New People's Party and which ran uh, for the elections under the name Liste Kurz, uh, new, new Austrian People's Party, was really a time 
uh, were there was a huge break with the traditional way of how um, Islam and Muslims were governed as it was for decades in the Second Republic. If we think back about like um, the, the days of Bruno Kreisky and also um, the late, the late uh, and, and, and 1990s, where the People's Party would basically have very much the opposite position uh, uh, towards Islam and Muslims as we can as compared to nowadays. Um, so there is this very interesting case in the 1990s when there was a decision made by the then president of the Islamic Council to argue uh, Muslim girls have to wear the headscarf during um, uh, uh, when Muslim, uh, when Islamic classes are taught in public school. And there, Erhard Buzek, who was back then uh, the minister of education from the People's Party really defended uh, the, uh, uh, the president of the Islamic Council, arguing that these are internal affairs. So we can really see how this uh, discourse has uh, um, fundamentally uh, changed throughout the last 20 years. And I think a lot of that has also to do uh, not only with the, 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 the discursive pressure that uh, emerged with the rise of the uh, far right again, uh, after 2005, but also very much with how a very young leadership of the People's Party is viewing uh, issues around Islam today. Uh, so like very simply, uh, simply put, um, a lot of the uh, primary advisors of, uh, of Sebastian Kurz Islam policies go back to a person um, um, who is very much like personally um, um, related to these issues uh, in terms of identity politics and so on. And so I think there is also uh, like beyond the, the larger political paradigms that can explain this shift, there is also this personal dimension to a lot of the politicians um, uh, who shape these policies. So in a way, what we can see is that throughout the last few years, um, the politics of Islam has shape the politics of religion, obviously with the new Islam Act, but also the politics of education through restructuring and uh, mobilizing against, let's say, uh, Muslim kindergartens, private educational institutions. But first and for, uh, foremost, I would argue the security apparatus. So um, um, the way how the Austrian secret service looks at Muslims, uh, was previously very much through the lens of the Islamic religious society is our partner in security. And throughout, within the last three, four years, what we have seen is Muslims are regarded as a societal threat. Um, so also, if you look um, into the annual report of the Austrian uh, secret agency, back then the BVT and today the DSN, uh, we can see this new perspective of uh, problematizing any form of uh, organized uh, civil Muslim society as being a potential threat uh, to the Austrian political system. All right, um, I spoke exactly 30 minutes, so I, <clears throat> um, I tried to stick very much to the time and I do hope that we're going to have, and I'm sure we're going to have uh, an interesting discussion. Uh, now. Okay, thank you. thank you very much, Dr. Hafez, for a very uh, interesting talk.